Hi there, uh, my name is Marcel Jaspers. I'm Professor of Chemistry at the University of Aberdeen and Director of the Marine Biodiscovery Centre. I've been working in the area of BBNJ for the last six years. My name's Abby Brown. I'm a professor in intellectual property law at the University of Aberdeen, and I've been working in marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction for about one year. Marcel, as you've been saying, you've been working in the marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction area for some time. How did it all get started? Well, back in the early 1980s, when the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea was framed, uh, they omitted any mention of marine biodiversity. But back in the late 90s, Lal Gloka, in his paper, The Deepest Ironies, pointed this out. And the UN started the process in the early 2000s uh, called the Working Group, which discussed all the topics. And then in, in 2015, the decision was made to launch a preparatory committee, which resulted in an intergovernmental commission in um, 2017. Gosh, so a long journey. Yes, a long journey. Interesting. Um, and in our two other videos, we've explored a little bit on marine biodiscovery and also a little bit on intellectual property rights. And the aim of today is really explore a little bit how those things can and should be drawn together. So starting with patents, how important do you see them to you as a scientist working in marine biodiscovery? So most scientists are interested in sharing what they discover. Um, without any restriction. So a lot mm -hmm. of scientists will publish right away without even thinking about patenting something. Mm -hmm. But there are occasions when your work leads to something so exciting that you want to try and apply for a patent uh, to be able to protect it and, and to prevent others from using that information. Interesting. And is the, the, the position the same, do you think, if you're working in, say, a spin-out company rather than more as a university scientist? So no, I think for, for companies, um, and, and just, just to say, I've started a couple of, of spin-outs so far, and one of them has failed and, and one of them is about to start. Um, uh, the key there is I think you need the patents to show investors mm -hmm. that you're serious. Mm -hmm. But secondly, also you need to be able to, to show that you have the ability to work in that area and prevent other people from doing the same work that you might be working on. Interesting. And so from that base, what do you think is the most important thing for a scientist to come about in the marine biodiversity negotiation process? So most important uh, for scientists would be for, to have no restrictions on marine scientific research and uh, for us to be able to continue the kind of work that we've been doing in the past to help uh, conservation of biodiversity mm -hmm. uh, predominantly, but also, for instance, if we want to discover new uh, molecules against cancer or new enzymes that might be able to help with um, uh, making industrial processes more green and more clean, um, then we would need to have something that not only uh, didn't hinder the scientists, but also help them perhaps coordinate and cooperate better. That might include something like having information about where research cruises are going, who's going on them, when they're going, and how you might be able to join as a, as, as a participant mm -hmm. from a landlocked country, mm -hmm. for instance. And that's critical because I think once we know more about the oceans, once we share more information about the oceans, it'll be much, much better for conservation, uh, especially in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And, and sometimes within that process, we see reference to terms such as open access or perhaps open source. What, what do you mean by that? So for scientists, again, th these terms are a bit fuzzy. We tend to use them interchangeably. Uh, but what we're really thinking about most of the time is that we get access to information, for instance, or materials um, free of charge mm -hmm. and free from any restrictions that might be on them so that we can, able, we can use them in uh, future discoveries without having to worry too much about who owns the original data. And that's such a fascinating point because lawyers also have their views on what those terms mean. And I think the underlying point is very, very similar, um, that idea of ensuring wider access as, as much as possible. But often from the legal sense when one sees those words, it tends to be about the fact, I don't have to pay you or I don't have to pay you if I'm using it for these particular circumstances. So I think it's such an important point of why this dialogue is so, is so useful, so that law and science can really work together as, as usefully as we can. So as an IP lawyer, what is the most important aspect of the new regime that might come into place uh, for biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction? I think it's important that it engages with the strong benefits which can come about from intellectual property rights. It enables that to come to pass and also we ensure that some of the more negative impacts of IP are not entrenched in the new agreement. Okay, then can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
So for example, the idea of a patent is this encourages people to invest, it encourages people to innovate, and then it gives people the power to control the use of that invention in a particular country for a particular period. And, and that can be a fantastic thing, but it can also mean that within that period, if the patent owner chooses not to allow you to use it, or you can't afford to pay the money, then actually the wider societal benefit which can come from that and the benefit for other scientists and possible for further companies is very, very narrow. So, so that can be a risk. Also from, from other rights such as trade secrets, copyright and database rights, they can apply to, we were talking about the idea of information being shared about, for example, where cruises have gone. That information can be shared very, very widely, mm -hmm. but people may be able to say, I have rights over that, or that information is secret. So if those rights are relied upon, the full benefit which could arise from finding out what's going to on and requiring that it should be shared actually could be blocked, because the IP owner could say, you say I'm supposed to share it, oh. I'm not going to share it. Now, IP law actually does have a lot of possible solutions to that. International IP treaties do say that states can choose to have some exceptions to their IP rights, mm -hmm. not unlimited ones, but there is some flexibility there. And there can also be, for example, required sharing of maybe a particular piece of technology, which might be very important in the development process. So the answer is can lie within IP mm -hmm. law, but it is important, I think, that we explore how best that can actually be made to work to enable this extremely important marine biodiversity process to work effectively. So isn't all of that IP stuff already being discussed elsewhere? Some of it is. Um, certainly in relation to um, the World Trade Organization, which has one of the big uh, tri treaties, which we tend to call the TRIPS Treaty, it says that there are these flexibilities. It doesn't go further than that in most cases, but we don't really need it to go any further. That opportunity is there already. That, I think, then leaves it to, to countries to choose to take those opportunities, and I think leaves the opportunity for this marine biodiversity process mm -hmm. to actually say, OK, countries, you're going to do this, yeah. and you will take that opportunity. And that, I think, is, is very consistent with the TRIPS mm -hmm. agreement, and there's lots of reference in the draft agreement, for example, to complementing and not undermining. So I think the fact that something has been done elsewhere is actually a very strong base for further work to be done here. One area which get, gets further attention is the idea of disclosure of origin. So you have obtained some marine genetic resources and you may be using them to further develop, um, ultimately, say, a very important new medicine. And there's been lots of argument that the way that one can ensure that the benefit which has been obtained from the ocean is shared widely with everyone is we need to know where it mm. came from. And there is negotiations um, within the marine biodiversity process about whether that should be done. There have for a long time been negotiations in other bodies. Firstly, the World Intellectual Property Organization, that's been going on for a long, long time regarding genetic resources mm. more generally. It's been going extremely slowly. It's a very, very controversial issue, mm. which um, of course doesn't mean it's going to be easy to solve in this process either. But I think an important point there is that those draft agreements make it very clear they do not propose to engage with the area beyond national jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a space to say that if we, we choose to engage with this in this UN process, that that is not unreasonably encroaching on what's going on in the World mm -hmm. Intellectual Property Organization. There have also been some discussions at the World Trade Organization that there should be some amendment to that TRIPS treaty to mm -hmm. require disclosure of origin. That again has slightly stalled. This again suggests this is controversial, suggests these agreements, reaching an agreement on this would not be easy. But again, I think to say that the answer is being addressed elsewhere, mm -hmm. I think is, is inaccurate. I think much more important for this present process is if we feel it is important for this issue to be addressed, then it should be done here, that, that initiative should very much be seized. Well, that's all very interesting. Uh, it's good to hear more about that. Uh, so if you had a magic wand uh, mm -hmm. to make an ideal treaty, uh, what would you do? What would you want to have included in that treaty and how would you like it to work? Oh, how exciting. Um, I think there's two ways. That's also a diff difficult question to ask a lawyer. Um, one way is to explore in a lot of depth the intellectual property related issues mm -hmm. that we've been exploring. Um, there's some very strong views that IP should not be referred to in the treaty at all. Personally, 
I think building pipes over where I think that that's a real mistake. But lots of different issues could arise. One view is it'd be very helpful to say that there will be these exceptions imposed by countries on their IP rights. There will be required sharing of technologies in particular circumstances. There will be particular approaches taken mm -hmm. to disclosure of origin. And while that might work very effectively from one legal point of view, there is a risk that something might be left out, mm -hmm. first of all. There, there is also a question of whether that is practically workable within mm -hmm. the time but which, which sure. is available in the negotiation process. I think the other angle is that, and in the present draft treaties, there is some much more open wording about intellectual property which talks about it being supportive, for example. And I think as long as there has been appropriate dialogue and understanding mm -hmm. that this doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be lots of power to the IP owners, yep. that, that, that this balanced approach to, to IP would be taken, then I think that can be really workable. I find it very encouraging that there's been an increasing space for IP debate in the more recent uh, intergovernmental yeah. meetings and in intersessional meetings. So uh, I think trying to continue to bring IP to be part of the debate and to ensure that taking that balanced approach to it as to so many other factors mm -hmm. which we're seeing across the treaty is I think the, the most important way forward. What about you? What if you had a magic wand? Well, uh, it's quite an interesting question again. So, so from my perspective I would really like to see a sort of pragmatic solution to the whole problem based on good scientific practice already. Um, and that would mean something like better cooperation, better coordination, better sharing of information about what's happening right now. So that actually uh, biodiversity beyond na national jurisdiction is surveyed better, we know mm -hmm. more about it, uh, and, and we share that information globally, so for everybody's benefit. Um, and based on that, you can make better conservation measures. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, I would like to make sure that any benefits that do arise are shared equitably. That's really important, again, that everybody shares in this and, and takes part in it, mm -hmm. that everybody has the capacity to um, use uh, sustainably the materials from areas beyond natural jurisdiction. And I think that's really critical as, a, as, a, as a, a concept. And finally, the most important thing, of course, is that this thing is all about conservation and sustainable use. Absolutely. And the conservation aspect should really come foremost at the end of all of this. Fascinating. So thank you. Um, I think that's been a really interesting discussion. I hope anyone else watching has also found it useful to learn more about how we see law and science can really work together in this important journey to the rest of the marine biodiversity process. We've been working with other colleagues, notably in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiatives and lots of other NGOs and IGOs and obviously working with delegates who will be negotiating so many very important weeks and months ahead and we really hope we can make a contribution to bring about an effective and pragmatic and workable solution. So thank you. Thank you.